Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Learning Grow webinar. My name is Mary McDonald. I'm Senior Manager of Education at the Canadian Franchise Association, and I will be your host for today's event. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's session is titled The Fundamentals of Franchising and is part of the CFA's Elevate and Empower series, which aims to empower women in the industry and female entrepreneurs with guidance, knowledge, and tools for their career development for a successful business ownership. Before we begin, please note the following housekeeping items. All attendees are to remain mute unless prompted. Please feel free to type in your questions at any time during this presentation in the Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen. Today's webinar is being recorded so that it can be accessed later on. And please also note the following legal disclaimer. This webinar and the information provided is not legal advice. Each franchisor and franchisee should consult their legal and business advisors to determine how this information works within the context of your franchise system and your franchise agreement. All right, well now let's begin by introducing our speaker for today. I am thrilled and delighted to be joined today by Kristen Gale. Kristen Gale, creator and CEO of the 10 Spot Beauty Bars, has propelled the brand from a single Toronto location to an international franchise with 47 bustling bars across Canada and the US and 21 more in development. A trailblazer in beauty and franchising, Kristen's entrepreneurial flair has earned her spots on Canada's Top 40 Under 40 and the Chatelaine Magazine W100 list. Under her leadership, the 10 Spot has garnered awards like Profit Magazine's 500 Fastest Growing Companies and the CFA's Franchisee Choice Awards, reflecting Kristen's mantra, life at 10, guiding her business and life approach. So, I, without further ado, I turn over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Mary. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm delighted to talk all about franchising. It's one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. Um, so I don't know if everybody heard, but I am actually uh, at the Miami International Airport um, and I'm just flying home from a conference. So uh, I forgive me for any of the airport announcements that you might hear during this webinar. Um, and let's just get right into it. The Fundamentals of Franchising. So as mentioned, my name is Kristen Gala. I'm the creator of the 10 Spot Beauty Bars. Um, for those that don't know my brand, it's um, it's a franchise chain of one-stop beauty spots. So we do manis, putties, waxing, laser, and facial services. Uh, I started my business when I was 24 years old with the one location. And, um, and now we are coast to coast all across Canada into the United States. Um, I had uh, a couple of corporate stores myself um, at, at uh, there's four, there was actually five, but I franchised one and then I opened up another one. So five in total that I had. And then I, um, I started franchising in 2012. I didn't want to be on my own doing this thing anymore. I wanted to actually have other, other like-minded ladies join me and have their own locations. So uh, we've been doing that for, yeah, since, uh, since 2012, it's been a long time. So the reason why the 10 spots exists is to make everybody feel like a 10. Um, you know, when we put them, uh, we make somebody feel put together and polished, they feel more confident and more confident people do great things. Confident people live their best lives ever. Um, confident people live their life at a 10. And so that's been my purpose for as long as I can remember, um, over the last two decades, I've really built my business and my life with that sole purpose of, you know, wanting to, uh, wanting to live my life, um, the best way that I can and be, and be the best, you know, sort of, um, person I can be mom, I can be, um, have the best relationship and have the best business life. And so it's really my mission to, um, inspire and enable other women to do the same, which is why I am so proud and thrilled to be here. Um, just teaching about franchising, cause there are so many different franchise opportunities out there. And, um, and I love the, I love the franchise business model. So I think that they're, uh, one of the very best ways to live your best life is through, entrepreneurship and that, um, it's, you know, it's filled with this, uh, it's filled with a lot of thrills, but also this freedom where you get to be your own boss. You get to be in control of your time in control of your life. You get to craft a schedule that works for you and your family and your lifestyle. 
Um, and then it's also one that there's this untapped earning potential. So, you know, you get to create this career for yourself that is both meaningful for you. And then at the same time, you get to build an asset of value. So to me, that's really what living a life of purpose and fulfillment is all about. So I'm so, so excited um, about uh, about business and about entrepreneurship and, and delighted that uh, that you guys are here to learn more about this type of a business model. And so the reason why I actually love franchising, um, the franchising business model in particular, is I think that it's the very best version of business ownership. And that's because in addition to getting all of the stuff that comes along with just regular entrepreneurship, um, you also are not alone. And so everybody knows that, you know, most businesses fail. And yet with um, franchising, those numbers really drop dramatically because you are working this proven business model with reams and reams of operational support, marketing support, business coaching support. Um, and then it also offers this built-in network of other franchise partners who are all doing the same thing that you are. And as I'd mentioned, you know, it was like, I had the business by myself and I was doing it for a number of years on my own. And it really was that idea of being able to, uh, to grow the business, but do it with other people, um, which is what drove me into franchising. And, it, and it's, um, it's what I love so much about it. So let's get into the wonderful world of franchising. Um, first off, despite what the world seems to think and the narrative that's kind of being pushed is that franchising was not created by Ray Kroc of McDonald's. Um, it was actually created by a woman from Oakville, Ontario, Canada in the late 1800s. So I think, you know, that's a time when it was really unheard of for a woman to own her own business, let alone be in the workforce, um, or even to be considered a person yet. Um, and, uh, and so she started this, um, beauty salon franchise, which is so fun, uh, because that's of course the, the, what I'm in. So her name was Martha Matilda Harper. So Martha Harper opened up her first salon in um, 1888. It became so popular that celebrities would come and travel to see her. And then at the urging of her clients to open up more salons, she actually created the world's first franchise business model. So she licensed out the name of her business, the Martha Matilda Harper, I think it was called the Harper Method. Uh, and then she taught the business model to other working class women like herself. And at the peak of her time, she had over 500 locations, which is just, I can't, it's, it's crazy. It's, I'm, you know, I've been doing this for 17 years and we're at 45. So to have 500 locations, it's, uh, it's so incredible and so, so inspiring. So spread the word. It's International Women's Day coming up. Let people know that franchising was created from Martha Matilda Harper. Um, so let's talk about franchising, what that is exactly. So everybody knows that everybody's heard of McDonald's, Tim Hortons, the NFL. Everybody has this basic understanding of the word. But I think that very few truly knew, know the inner workings of the franchise business model. Um, and, uh, and furthermore, that there are so many different types of business that are franchise businesses. So a great resource is the lookforafranchise.ca website that the Canadian Franchise Association has created. And um, it's just a database of incredible franchise businesses. Um, so you can go in and, uh, and just read about them and see which ones light you up and get you on fire and get you excited. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is that franchising is a business model. So business model meaning um, you can be a corporation, uh, you can be a multi-level marketing type of thing. So think like Amway or Stella and Dot. Um, you can also have a subscription-based business like Netflix. Um, but the way that franchising works is it is a um, it is a contractual relationship business model. And so what that means is that the relationship of the both parties um, is based on a contract. And so it's very similar to a landlord tenant situation where their contract, the contract between the two parties, the landlord and the tenant is their lease. Um, in franchising, the contract between the two parties, so between the franchise and the franchisee is called the franchise agreement. Um, and so the franchise agreement is really what outlines the parameters of the relationship. 
and then details all of the obligations that each party has to one another. So the two parties that are involved are the franchisor. So this is the brand. So it's usually going to be the similar case to how I got started, which is that somebody starts one location, it's a one-off, um, and they develop out that business concept. So they refine the business model, they work out all the operational kinks, they create the branding, the logos, the trademarks, all of the other sort of proprietary information. Um, they perfect the marketing programs, they figure out the pricing, they figure out the products and service mix. Um, they, they do all of that foundational work to make that business successful. And then realizing the success of that initial location um, and, and figuring out that, you know, this is, this is a, I've got a good thing going here. Let's do more of these um, and wanting to grow instead of just doing it themselves by taking out loans or taking on investors, um, which can be very expensive and, and usually a much slower growth path. They may decide to grow via franchising. And so this is a, an easier way and a faster, um, maybe not easier, a faster way to market dominance. So they will go to a lawyer and get their franchise agreement created. And then they will be able to start to offer their business concept um, and their intellectual property and all the things in terms of the marketing and the, the, the operational programs and the products and services and stuff like that that they've developed. And then they get to license it out to the franchisees. So um, you'll hear the term franchisee. Um, you might hear the term franchise partner. We are ca we call our uh, franchise partners franchise partners in our system because we consider them like partners with us. Um, and they are uh, they are the entrepreneurs that get to skip all of the heavy lifting of the brand creation phase and then just go right into the operational phase of of running a proven model. So a franchisee or, or franchise partners can be either an individual person. Um, or it can be a group of partners that will go in and decide to uh, decide to open up a, a business themselves. So that's usually for, well, it can be, anyone can do, do a, you know, an, an individual or, or a partnership, but um, something like a good example would be a keg. So kegs are multi, multi-million dollar builds and, and projects. So oftentimes you'll find franchise partner groups that will go in and, um, and develop out uh, the the business that way. So um, the the type of business that they that they might um, open might be a bricks and mortar location. So if, like an actual physical space, um, or it might be um, the business model might be like a, a truck. And so that would be like 1-800-GOT-JUNK. So you would actually um, get the truck and, you'd, you know, you'd brand it and you'd, and you'd learn all about it that way. Um, or it could be something like a home care franchise where you don't have any sort of physical assets to the business model, um, but rather you um, you give a service. So you would have maybe healthcare or personal support workers that would be under your brand, like a nurse next door or something like that, where they would be under your brand and um, and you would be the uh, the franchise owner of, of a, um, a sort of territory based business. So it's really the franchisees that are delivering the brand experience directly to the customers. And to me, I think that that's why, or one of the very best things about the franchising business model is that it creates these optimal conditions for business success by creating this unstoppable dream team. So on the one hand, you have this strong franchisor who's dedicated to enhancing the system with new marketing initiatives, creating new service or product innovations. Uh, they grow the brand through creating more franchisees and opening up more units. This is a major benefit of franchising, which I'm going to get into more in depth with. And then they also give support to the franchisees in terms of business coaching and quality control. So they ensure that that brand consistency across all of the franchise units. And in essence, they protect that brand. And that's something actually that's very important that you want um, as a to know as a franchisee is that you do have a very tight uh, a tight franchise or that keeps that system tight because of course um, your investment is everybody's uh, or is everybody's investment and so you don't want um, you know some someone ruining the brand reputation for you um, and therefore ruining your brand investment so you actually want a very tight uh, franchise agreement and it may seem that it's a little bit 
sided on the on the side of the franchisor, but it's actually a good thing because it's actually on the side of the brand and you will be part of the brand. So that's something that uh, that you'll just want to make sure of. And then on the other hand, you get the owners and they are the ones running those locations. So as WestJet says, owners care. Um, and it's true. So it's much better for a brand to have owners running the location and delivering that brand experience directly to customers and staff and having an owner be the face of the business and enhancing their communities um, versus just hiring somebody with, with you know, maybe no skin in the game um, and no ties to success or failure of, of the business. And so the other thing is that you'll make the the owners sort of more ensure that like every dollar that can be maximized um, because of course they own the joint um, and their income and their profitability are tied to that success. So it's really this like wonderful little um, wonderful dynamic that you have going on within the franchising business model. And I think the other thing that makes franchising so powerful is that the incentive structures are aligned. So the better the franchisor does and the better the franchisees do, and then the better the franchisees do, the better the franchisors do. And it's this really wonderful win-win setup, which I'm going to go into again. So before I get into the, uh, the, the win-win incentive structure of franchising that I adore so much, I have to talk a little bit about how the franchisor earns its revenue, which is um, how you understand the, the, the win-win situation. So um, it's obvious how the franchisees or the locations or the, um, you know, locations or, or like I said, you know, it could be trucks or it could be um, a service-based business. But how they make money is they're selling directly to the consumer. So that's how their revenue comes in. So it might be through a variety of, of different revenue streams. You might have subscriptions within uh, the franchisee's business model, or it's the products or the services, but it's they're selling directly to the customer. In franchising, um, the way that the uh, the it works is that the franchisees are essentially the customers of the franchisor. So the service that you're buying from a franchisor as a franchisee is like how to be an entrepreneur and how to run your own business. And so primary revenue streams for a franchisor are going to be an initial fee and a royalty fee. So when you become a franchisee, you will pay an initial fee. So that initial fee is going to it's usually due when the franchisee signs a franchise agreement. And so that's why they call it an initial fee because it happens right at the start, the initial part. And so this fee is usually more of a fee to cover costs. So it's not necessarily that that the franchise or is making a ton of money off of this fee. Um, it's, it's basically going to be paying for you to um, go from knowing absolutely nothing about how to run the business model um, and perhaps even knowing nothing about the industry itself that you're getting into to getting you fully prepared to own and operate your new business with confidence. And so that takes, you know, a lot of human capital could, to get you up and running and operational. So everything from helping partners for us, um, you know, finding their locations, finding their contractors, sometimes helping them with financing, uh, getting their spaces built out, um, filled with supplies, getting it set up, getting software systems integrated, getting all the marketing programs launched and, you know, creating the successful launch plans. Um, so it honestly takes a, a little bit of a village um, to get a new franchise partner from signing the franchise agreement to being fully open and operational. And this all gets covered through that initial fee. The second way that franchise partners, um, or sorry, that that uh, franchisors' um, revenue streams come in and, and make money is via a percentage of sales. So this is a royalty fee. This is an ongoing fee, whereas the initial fee is the one-time fee that you just pay. It's one and done. The royalty fee is an ongoing fee that as soon as you're open and operational and you're bringing in revenue, you would then pay um, a royalty fee to the head office. It's usually 6% um, of... Uh, of top line sales. Um, and that's going to cover the ongoing rights to use the brand. So all the branding, the logos, the trademarks, so that you can still call your, so that you can run under your location under the banner of the franchisor. Um, and then it's also going to cover all of the support and the innovations that the brand is going to make during the time as you're, as a franchisee. So, um, you know, usually franchise terms, I think are, are ours is a 10 year term initially. So all of the new services that you that we bring in, um, any new products, um, all the marketing campaigns. Usually, franchisors have a cadence of of, um, of 
of marketing campaigns that they're going to do. And so this is why, because it's a percentage of your revenue, the better the franchise partner does, the better the franchisor does. Now, 6% is nothing. It's a very small amount. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the, the franchisee making the 94% is lovely and amazing. And of course you can't sustain a business model off of just making 6% of, of one location. And so that's why franchisors need to have a lot of locations in order for their business model to work. Um, and the, uh, the fact is, is that when a, when a franchise system has a lot of, um, a lot of locations, it's actually really great for each individual franchisee at the same time. And that's because, and this is my favorite part, where we get to this wonderful win-win incentive structure of the franchising relationship. So it's really this little synergistic flywheel. So as the franchise system grows and more locations are added, this increase in location creates more brand awareness. So obviously there's more of them out there. Um, And then at that that um, having more locations also creates um, a better market dominance over the competition. And then you also get um, better economies of scale, meaning products get cheaper for everyone because you're all buying them from the same supplier. And usually you'll get some really good volume discounts there. So these are all great things for a franchise, a franchise partner. And then the revenue that gets created from, um, from these new locations uh, being born means that there's an increase um, in franchisor support because, of course, now instead of making 6% of just one location, you're making 6% of 10 locations or 20 locations. And so now the franchisor has an ability to um, increase its operations, meaning usually hiring people. And so that really builds out a better support system for the franchise partners. So you can hire more staff in the marketing department, more staff in the operations department, more um, individual coaches to help support the franchise partners, which means if they're getting better support and and more marketing programs and more coaching, um, that usually means that they are going to um, be able to make more money. And uh, and that's going to, of course, um, create happier franchise partners because a happy franchise partner is one that is making money. And when you have happier franchise partners, they lead to more locations getting open because other people see, you know, these bars getting open up. They see these happy franchise partners. They see them making money. And then of course, this leads to even more franchisors, more franchisor support, more brand awareness, more market dominance, better cost savings um, for everybody, more support people, more programs. Um, and so it really does strengthen the resilience of the brand. And so this, um, this ultimately leads into a great return on investment for everyone. So not only do you have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, you know, it's like, where should we go for coffee? It was Starbucks because there's a, a trillion of them and it's just, you know, in, in people's brains because they have such market dominance. But when a franchise partner goes to sell their location, their resale value should be higher as well. So it's really this wonderful thing where um, having having a strong system and having a strong franchisor and having a lot of locations means that, you know, you you own that market and people it's butts in seats and people coming to you um, during the length of your term, but then also so when you decide like, Hey, I'm, I, uh, um, I've, I've done this for a while and I want to get out, then, then usually you, you get a better, um, price for, for selling your business than you would if it was potentially just, um, you were on your own and, and it was a brand that only had one location. So like I said, total win-win. This is why I love it. So I want to move on into, um, and I'm going to actually, we'll have some time, I think for some questions after this. So if anybody has any questions, um, put them in the chat and, uh, and Mary will let me know in a minute. And um, now I want to move on to some of the ins and outs of this contractual relationship, which means we have to get into franchise law. So in most provinces in Canada and in, um, in all of the states, there's franchise law. So this is really, um, this is what legislation that governs what franchisors can and cannot do. So the main point of franchise legislation is that franchisors have to disclose all material information pertinent in order for a potential franchisee to make an informed decision. So this is a great thing for you as a prospective franchisee is to know that there is legislation put in place to protect you. So what ends up happening is that you will be given a document. 
Um, and this, uh, this document is called a franchise disclosure document. So FDD for short is kind of the lingo that you'll hear. And this, um, this document really tells you everything that you need to know about the business that you are looking at getting into. So it's going to tell you what the ownership structure is like, who the owners are, what the trademarks that they own are. Because again, if you, you know, you think you're buying a brand that has a, a trademark that's protected and you make signage out of it and you make, you know, your marketing materials and you've paid for a whole bunch of stuff. And then you find out that they don't even own the trademark and, and somebody else does, and they're going to make you unbrand your store that will suck. So you want to make sure that, uh, that they actually own what they say they're going to own. It's going to go over what all of your costs will be. It's going to cover the training and the support that you're going to get. It's going to go over all fees and, and ongoing things. Like there might be software charges that are particular to the industry you're getting into. It's going to cover the obligations that you will have um, to the franchisor and also the obligations that the franchisor has to you as a franchise partner. It's going to go over some historical revenue potentially, and then you're also going to get a copy of the franchise agreement. So you the so the disclosure document is really just giving you all the intel about the franchisor, um, and the franchise agreement is the thing you sign with the franchisor. But of course, you want to be able to read that ahead of time, so it is included in the disclosure document. So some of the stuff that you're going to find in the disclosure document um, are things like the initial investment breakdown. So this is such an amazing thing that you get as being uh, as being someone interested in owning a franchise is that take it from someone that that just like started from scratch, you actually don't know what all of your costs are going to be. And not just like a couple of small little things, but like huge, major, major purchases that just, you know, you don't know till you, you know, you don't, you don't know what you don't know. And so um, the thing that's wonderful is because franchisors have built out a bunch of locations and they've done this, they really do know all of the costs that are going to be included in, um, in starting your business. So um, if you are a bricks and mortar business, um, it's going to cover all things like your build out costs, your drawings, your permits, your construction, your coordination. If it's not a bricks and mortar business, anything that you'll need. So if it's a kiosk, um, you know, what the cost for the kiosks are going to be, if it's a truck, what all the costs associated with the truck will be, you know, buying the truck, branding the truck, all that stuff. Um, if there's, uh, if it's a location-based business, if there's any custom mill work, you know, stuff that's very, um, that you can't just go to Ikea and buy something, um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be included in there. All of your opening equipment, all of your fixtures, all of your supplies will be in this chart. Um, again, if you have a location, your first and last month's rent will be included in this chart because of course you can't rent a space if you don't put down first and last month's rent. Um, it's going to cover your legal fees. So um, things like, uh, actually, I'll talk about the legal fees in a second, um, staff wages for your training. So you're going to have some staff, you need to train them before you get open and operational so they know what they're doing. Um, and that's going to be included in this initial chart, any initial marketing spend you're going to have. So this is really wonderful because it's your budget and like it's everything from the moment you are interested in signing a franchise agreement with someone right up until you are open and operational. And that's what I mean with the legal fees being included is that you'll want to take the franchise agreement to a lawyer to have them read it over, not necessarily to make changes because most franchisors will not change their franchise agreement. It's the same contract that every franchisee has signed with them. So they don't, they don't um, usually do anything custom for it, but just to make sure that you know what you're signing. Um, and so that cost is actually usually included in the initial investment chart because, of course, it is every single penny that you will need to spend to become open and operational. So the other things that are going to be included in your um, in the disclosure document is the list of fees. So some of these we've talked about, it's the initial fee and your um, royalty fee. So the actual rates are going to be in there. Um, what Another fee that is usually included in franchising is a brand fee or a marketing fee or an ad fund fee. They're all kind of named different things, but essentially it's not revenue for the franchisor, but it's rather a collection that the franchisor makes on behalf of all of the franchisees. And then that gets contributed um, 
to marketing activities to uh, to garner customers for the franchise locations. So this is really great because if you were just a one-off coffee shop, you can't afford to hire Justin Bieber to do Bieber bits for you. Um, but if you um, if you are a big franchise brand and every franchise partner has collectively contributed into the brand fund, usually it's about two percent. It might be higher, it might be slightly lower, but I think 2% is kind of the going rate. All of that 2% um, from all those locations gets collected. And then you can create these really bigger, more impactful campaigns like hiring, you know, Justin Bieber to, to make some little, little timbits for you. The other things that, so that's a real, it's a real benefit to franchising because you have this strong brand power that you are able to, uh, to use. Um, the other thing that's going to be listed for you are other industry specific fees, because there might be specific software that you need to use specific insurance. If it was say a childcare franchise concept, uh, you're, you know, that's going to have specific insurance for dealing with little kids, or if it's, you know, dealing with people going into people's homes, that's going to have different insurance. We have specific, um, spa insurance that, uh, that we use. Um, specific spa software so that you're going to want to know what uh, what to expect in terms of that. Uh, and then it's going to cover how territories work. So if you have a, uh, say, a, a concept where um, uh, it's a service-based company, like a nurse next door or something where it's a, it's a personal home care uh, based business, you're probably going to have a territory in which that you own that market. Um, likewise, if, if it's an actual territory where it's a bricks and mortar business, you'll also have like a protected radius usually around where they won't put another location. So that'll be included. How that works will be included in the disclosure document. Um, they'll talk to you about how leases work. Um, if you're on the head lease, if they're going to be on the head lease, how, how that works, what your training is going to be like, how long it's going to take, what requirements um, you need to make in terms of, of you getting trained. It might be online training. It might be in-store training. Um, and so you'll just want to know about that because you need to make arrangements for your life. And, and if you're going to have to um, fly into uh, their head office to be trained or, um, or if it's virtual. So all of that stuff you will be able to find out in the disclosure document. So it's going to tell you everything that you need to know about the business that you are looking to get into. Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's going to tell you everything that you need to know about the business minus just your how you feel about it and and if you're excited about the the company and the concept. Um, but anything that is material to making a business decision about this is going to be contained in this very important document. It's a long document. It's jargony. It is filled with legalese. I usually suggest, you know, getting a opening up a bottle of wine and and just sitting down with a highlighter and going through it and uh, and and trying to trying to understand it. If if um, if legal jargon is not your main thing, usually your franchisor will help you out and and answer any questions that you have about it. The one thing that I'm going to mention to you is what it won't include is it will not include how much money you're going to make. So I like to call this the black box questioning of franchising. Um, under franchise law, no franchisor can tell you how much money you are going to make, which does seem totally nutty that, that you know, if you're going to go in to buy a business, um, you want to know at least how much money it's going to make. Um, and unfortunately, they can't tell you. No one can tell you that. Um, because it is, uh, because it is, um, it's something where actually, um, how much money you're going to make is totally up to you as a, as a franchisee. Um, it's how hard you're going to hustle. It's how hard you're going to market. It's what location you end up picking. Um, it's how you're going to manage your staff. It's if you're going to be out in your community, it's how you manage your costs. Um, if you're going to make upgrades and reinvestments into your business so that it looks, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be competing with any new, new people. Um, any new competitors that hit there, um, it's going to be a, a lot of it is really up to you. So the way that I like to explain this is that in franchising, you're just given the car and it's, you know, bright. In our case, it's a bright, shiny, shiny orange car. Um, and, you know, it's all it's all been really built out for you. But how you drive the car is 100 percent up to you. So you can stall it. You can crash and burn it um, or you can drive it hard and fast and, and get to where you want to go. 
So it's your business. You're the owner. You're the owner. You're the operator. You're given all of the assets that you need to succeed. And whether you do or not is, is going to really be up to you. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, if others have done it in the system, um, and are still doing it, then that's proof of concept that it does work. Um, and just, uh, just how much, how, how well it works is, is going to be up to you. So this brings us to who franchising is perfect for, um, and who it's not perfect for. And so the first thing is, um, you have to be able to be, you have to be a driven person. Um, it's hard work. It's starting a business. Um, you know, it's still a hustle. It's still a grind. Um, and, um, you know, it, it comes with life-changing rewards, but it's, it's a business like opening up, a, it's your own business. So that's really the, the primary thing you're, like I said, you're given sort of the heavy lifting of the business creation side of things, but it's the operation side of the business. And so that really, you're going to need effort and energy and resilience. So it's great for people that have that mindset and work ethic to do whatever it takes to become successful. Um, so if you're looking for franchising as this sort of hands-off investment and you don't want it to be your passion and your everything and, you know, this, this new fun, you know, thing that you're doing with your life, um, don't go into business at all. Don't go into franchising. Don't go to business, um, buy real estate, buy stocks, do something, do something else. Uh, the second thing is that you want to have to work a proven system. So you have to be able to be, you have to be somebody that can trust and, and prove um, and, and work a system that's been proven. Um, no one, not you, not your franchisor wants anything. Like they don't want people to, to fail opening up, you know, a new, a new, uh, unit just to, just to have it not work out is, is tragic for everybody involved. And so this usually happens when people come in and think that they know better than the brand that's been operating for decades. And this is not to say that franchisees don't contribute absolutely, absolutely meaningfully to the advancement of a franchise system. The Big Mac was actually created by a franchisee. It just means that for the most part, you aren't the person that's like itching or dying to, to be in creator mode. Um, for example, I would make a horrific franchisee because that's just not me. I'm a franchisor. or my, you know, my role is the creation of the brand part, the idea part. Um, the franchise partner role is really that operational side of things. So you want to be the person to take the idea and then make it real and bring that to life for your customers and for your staff. So um, there's uh, there's a lot more other things that that your particular franchisor, as you get into speaking with them and, and going through some of the calls with them, that they're going to go over and that they're going to require you to be, um, if they're looking to to bring on franchise partners, everybody has a very direct selective criteria, uh, uh, criteria for selection. But those are sort of two, two main ones is that you've got to be able to work a franchise system because that's how franchising works. It needs to be consistent across all locations. Um, and you have to, you know, understand that it's your own business and you got to hustle. But the last thing that all franchisors um, make sure is that um, you have to be financially able to become a franchisee. So no franchisor, like I said, wants to set up anybody for failure. Running out of money mid-build or shortly after you're open and operational is like, you know, terrible for the franchisor and, and tragic for the franchise partner. So all franchisors will usually have a set of, of applications that you need to fill out just in, in order to ensure that you're a fit for their brand, but then also to make sure you have the financial capacity to open up a unit of theirs. Um, so speaking of money, um, I just wanted to mention this. So when you go and look at a franchise concept, and when you go on to look for a franchise.ca, you're going to see what the initial fee is, what the total costs are. Um, and you'll note that they're very, it's a, it's a spread because of course, a, a franchise, um, a franchise agreement is for everywhere, like from like coast to coast, for example, for us. So real estate and, and build out costs in downtown Toronto are going to be really different than real estate and build out costs in Winnipeg. So you'll see that there's always going to be a bit of a spread and it might even be a ginormous spread, like a hundred thousand dollars difference, but essentially you'll see there what that total investment cost is going to be. And it's okay if your bank account is not that high, um, because that's what banks are for. And in fact, there um, there is a small and what the government of Canada actually is for. So they have a fantastic program. It is called the Canadian Small Business Financing Program. 
if you go to uh, Canada.ca and then uh, and then backslash CSBFP um, or just Google it, uh, you will be able to find this program. So this program is specifically designed to create business owners in Canada. Um, it will cover, I think now they've just changed the regulations. So it will cover up to $500,000 of leasehold improvements, equipment, and fixtures. And so anything really that's a hard good will usually be covered um, up to 90% through this loan. And, um, and so it's, it's fantastic for bricks and mortars business. Um, I think you can also now they've just changed the rules, um, quite recently that you can also use $150,000 or of this loan towards a uh, softer goods. So I think even the franchise agreement, uh, that initial fee can be covered under this, uh, this loan as well. So it's a fantastic loan. I would say that 98% of our franchise partners have gotten fun funding through this, um, this program, the Canadian Small Business Financing Program. Um, it's put on through the government of Canada and um, all of the banks usually offer it. So whether you, you bank with TD or RBC or Scotiabank, CIBC, um, you can get the uh, financing through them. Um, and, uh, and like I said, it's through the government and I think it's also 75% guaranteed, which is lovely and amazing as well. So you're, you're really only on the, uh, 25% hook for that. You will likely need some unencumbered cash. What that amount is, is going to vary based off of franchisor to franchisor. Um, and that's just because of course the loan only covers 90%. So you'll need that extra 10%. And then there's also things in the loan where it might not cover. So for, for us, it won't cover supplies like soft supplies, like wax or wax strips or things like that. So that's stuff that you're going to need your cash to be able to cover for your initial setup. And that, oh my gosh, it's 1.42. I feel like I really did this in, in the time frame. So we have enough time for questions here. So this is uh, this is the, the question portion there. My Here's my contact information. If you have any other, um, want to reach out, have any questions, totally, uh, totally down to chit chat um, and talk more. But right now, I think we can open it up to questions and I'm going to stop sharing. Mary, I hope that was okay. Like it was, oh man, this is noisy, was, noisy up in here. It was brilliant and really, really informative. Thank you so much. Um, there were a few questions. Uh, we'll get started with one that we had from Sarah White. She asked, big question, but do you have tips for controlling brand perception and ensuring good service from your franchise partners? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, definitely. So that starts with with the training that... Uh... Uh, that the um, uh, that the franchise partners and also that the staff will receive because we want to make sure for, for us in particular it's a uh, it's a service based business and we want to have all of our um, uh, all of our services being um, done consistently and and executed really well um, across the board so it starts really with with the training um, and uh, and then we also have a lot of um, just resources for our franchise partner where, you know, it's like, we get that it's, these are human beings doing services. Like th there's going to be mistakes made. And so for us, it's just knowing that and then having the right support structures in place for our franchise partners, where if something does go wrong, here's how to fix it. And here's how to make it better for, uh, for the customer. And so um, we really do a lot of training on that and have a, have a great recess. We actually call it like, if something goes wrong, here's a, like the call it list of common complaints on how to deal with them, doc, um, and how to, uh, and how to, uh, win back that trust with the, uh, with the customers. Okay. So we try to come at it, come at it from a few different angles. Uh, education, of course, is always going to be an area of interest for me. Um, what are some of those educational strategies that you use, the training that you do? Is it, you mentioned coaching as being a big part. Um, what other types yes. of training can people expect? Oh God, we do like tons. So first of all, we have manuals. So every um, every role that we have within, within our system um, has a manual. So there is a franchise partner manual, there is a manager manual, there's a guest corner manual, and then there's an aesthetics manual. So speaking just in terms of, I'll just use the example of the aesthetics manual. So that's really every single service and like exactly how we want that service to be executed, right from how we want people to 
um, greet their guests. So we're more of a, you know, cheeky, fun, casual, uh, casual type friendly spa, ex- anti-spa experience. And so I actually want them to call our customers by their first name instead of, instead of having that formality to it. So we'll actually have that written in our protocol. So it's like, greet your guests by your first name, go in and, and, you know, figure out what services they're having, check their notes on their profile to see if there's, you know, any special occasions that they were getting ready for, or, you know, if they have special colors that they like using or, or um, any sort of notes on their profile profile, greet them. And then of course, exactly how we want the station to be set up and the service to be performed. So that's really the manuals. That's like the very, like the how to, and then what we'll do is um, if say we, we wanted to add an additional service to, uh, to our repertoire, we would then create a new manual section for that. That would then get the manual would get updated. That would be sent out to our franchise partners. And then we would have a live training. So if it's, if it's a service that, um, that can be done over Zoom and we can train that service because sometimes it's, it's a service where people already understand the basics of it, but it's just, we've, we've changed something to the, to the protocol, um, or we brought in a new product, but the new product doesn't involve any, tra- you know, hands-on training and we can train it over Zoom. We'll do um, an education session. So usually we have refresher education sessions on a calendar, on an education calendar. Um, but if we're bringing in a new launch, we'll do it there. Um, or we'll actually conduct training sessions or we'll send out our, our brand trainers and then they'll go into the locations and and uh, and teach a service innovation. So for something like that, we might have a, a rollout of the um uh, of the service, just so that locations can opt in, get get their staff trained. Um, if we're bringing in something new, and then and then once they're um, they've approved their estheticians to be on the floor for that, then they'll they'll sort of turn turn on those services in, in their um in their online booking and make that available for people to be able to book. Um, but that's sort of just one example of just the uh, the estheticians we have. Um, webinars every month for our franchise partners. We have business coaches that will have um, a series of a cadence of calls with them, just depending on where they are in our system. So if they're new franchise partners, they're weekly calls um, and they're just making sure that they've got all the support that they need in terms of marketing programs. And if we need to pull in, you know, our, our local marketing expert, she'll, you know, she'll come in and, and assist the franchise partner to build out an actual strategy and a plan and set the KPIs and, and give them all the resources and tools that they need to be able to conduct a marketing program. If they're, if they're a franchise partner that's been in the system for a long time and they've, you know, been at it for 10 years, maybe those calls are more monthly or quarterly, just depending on the support that they, that they require. Um, but we definitely work hand in hand with, with our partners. Amazing. It really sounds like you're operationalizing uh, culture it's and tough. values alongside with the brand. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand. yeah, yeah. Perfect. Uh, there's a question from John. He says, there's yeah. clearly or should be a non-compete provision with your franchisee should the agreement get severed due to non-performance. Have you been subject to any disputes arising from a franchisee opening a new store without your brand? Uh, no, because we do have that in there. Okay, perfect. And it yeah. sounds like one of our, our other um, guests today had answered, John, with regards to uh, needing a franchise consultant to get going or simply streamline it. With a franchise lawyer, you do indeed want to have a bit of a team on the go with lawyers, accountants, tax specialists, and more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you don't need a, consult, a franchise consultant unless you're really sort of, you know, lost in the sea of what concept do you want. I think that the look for a seat, look for a franchise um dot dot ca resources great because you can it's so easy you just go on and you're like oh that brand sounds interesting and you just fill out the form and someone will get in touch with you if you if you're interested if you you know reach out and you're interested um they they will definitely get back to you cuz um like i said the the um that incentive structure is really set up where where a franchisor really wants to build out more locations and so um they'll get in touch with you and then you'll just have a series of calls so um, the, the process might be different um, in terms of the length of time or what what you're going to get covered, but you will most likely, or at least in our case, you're really guided through um, a uh, a series of different calls and a series of information and a series of different webinars. So, uh, for for our our pipeline for um, for awarding franchises is you first start off and you have a call with me. So I do a really I talk about the the brand as a whole 
our purpose, our values, what, how I got, you know, how we got started, sort of what, what, um, what support we offer and more, and more of a, a, an overview. And then if you're interested and, and you want to learn more, then we book a call with, um, with our COO and she goes over um, the operational side of the business. So right from how do we get you from not having a space and not having a location and not having anything built out to, to having all of that. And then all of the operational and support structures that we have, then you'll do a call with our um, chief marketing officer. She goes through all of the marketing programs that are offered and the support that you would get um, in terms of marketing. We then go through the legal stuff because then we'll disclose you. Um, we'll have another round of, of Q and A's. You'll meet more of the team. So there's, for us, there's a um, a pipeline and, and for most franchise partners there, there is for that. So if you just have those initial calls, you'll be able to know, like, you'll know this brand's not for me. I don't like these humans because again, it's a relationship business. So it's based on the contract, but that contract is really like a prenup. Like you, you know, you sign it in case things go weird, but you, you kind of just like you sign it and it goes in a, in a drawer. Now it doesn't go in a drawer. It's they're all virtual, but it goes, it gets filed away in your Google Drive, and then you you sort of shouldn't need to revisit the franchise agreement um, during during your tenure because it's a relationship. You are if you have a you have an issue, you talk to your franchisor about it. If they if they have an issue, they talk to you about it. Like you're you're in business for for a long chunk of time, and and um, and so it's uh, having a good relationship is really the the key to a, a great um, uh, franchise time <laughs> and and how what advice would you give for people who are thinking about becoming a franchisee before they commit to that 10-year relationship what kind of process can, should they do to um, decide whether this is going to be the right fit and whether this is actually going to be the person they want to get married to yeah I think I think um, tangible things that, that you really I mean there's your feelings so this, again, this is going to be your new life. You have to like the people and you have to be excited about it. You have to be excited about the business. So if you're, again, if you're just doing this as like, well, this is a widget and I don't really care about, you know, baking, but I think it's a good idea. Um, like if you buy a, a, a I know, um, oh, what's the, uh, I forget the, the brand name, Cobb's Bread. They, you have to be there. They, they want they're very committed to quality, which I totally agree with. And so they require the franchisee to be the actual head baker. And that means waking up at three in the morning to get baking so that you have fresh croissants and fresh baguettes and all, all of those, you know, yummy, delicious baked goods that Cobb has ready for that 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m. morning rush. Mm -hmm. If you don't love croissants and if you don't love baking, don't go into that brand because that one's not going to be right for you. Um, whereas, whereas if you do, then that's probably going to be a great indicator of, uh, of you, um, of you, uh, wanting to get into that brand. But like I said, the, the more of the tangible things that you're going to want to look for are like, do they actually have operational systems and support in place for you? So one of the things that I'll just note is like, it's real easy to become a franchisor in Canada. You pay a bunch of money to a lawyer and they draft up that document for you. And like, you're a franchisor. Um, that is a far different cry from actually in practice being a franchisor. And what happens is that, and this happened to me, was that a lot of newbie baby franchisors have a wonderful system. Like the, their locations are banging. I had everything ready to go for the actual operation of the, of the business unit. What I didn't have was anything set up for my franchise business, which was actually helping my new set of customers, which are the franchisees go from not having a location to being, sorry guys, to being totally open and operational. And so I didn't have, um, you know, I didn't have like, here's what we're going to look for when we go to find your space. Here's a really concrete, like easy to follow list of stuff that you need to buy for your supplies and like what it means. Like we have something called a dap and dish. Okay. What, what's a dap and dish? Like it's actually the little dish that you like squirt the product into when you go to bring it over for mm -hmm. the thing. But like, if that's just on an Excel sheet, nobody knows what that means. And it's like buy 36 dap and dishes and you're like, wait from where? So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it was that creating all of those 
you know, all those documents to be like, here's a DAPA dish. Here's a picture of it. Here's where you buy it. Here's the link to where you buy it. Here's how many you need. Here's the like line item in your budget so that you don't go over budget with, you know, your things and you're keeping track of all your costs. So, um, so it really took us, um, it took us a little bit of time and some patient first franchise partners to go through that, that growth, that those growing pains of realizing like, okay, it's not just that you need the actual business operations of the business that you're buying to be tight because most franchisors will have that. It's all of the other systems in place for like, what's the cadence of visits that I'm going to get um, that you're going to help me with? Like, do I get a business coach? Do you have a business coach that's hired? Do you have a marketing department? Or like, is it just, you know, you're making stuff on Canva, but you know, back in the day I was, you know, doing stuff on, on whatever and, and, um, and sending it, sending it out because when I only had the locations, that was fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but then realizing that, you know, it's not just, uh, it's not just that I have another location and I'm just going to train that person in that says it's my manager, the franchise partner is my customer and I need to guide them through a seamless entrepreneurship, you know, budding entrepreneurship journey of getting them from not being an entrepreneur to getting them to being a fully, you know, owning and, and operating it with confidence location and, and having that, um, be really streamlined for them. So I would just make sure that like, they have that, that, that what's the process for that they have, what's that pipeline from getting you from not having a location to, to having a location, what's that training really look like? Um, and, and do they have, uh, you know, do they have the support systems in place that, that you need? It's definitely, uh, from a franchisor perspective, an entirely new business model you really have to get. Your it is. Out. And it we is. do have a few people in our chat who are, are thinking themselves about um, becoming a franchisor, mm -hmm. establishing and selling your brand. I would just, as a small plug, if you are interested in the in diving into what's involved in franchising your business a bit more, we the CFA has an event that we hold four times a year called how to franchise your business, which uh, dives into exactly these topics. We have legal, uh, financial, accounting um, experts speak about the process of taking your brand and 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 becoming a business. Oh, and and get a membership to the CFA. Get a get a membership to the CFA because I will tell you it was the number one greatest resource that I could have ever had becoming a franchisor. Um, because, like I said, we weren't ready to. I just thought oh, great. I'm a franchisor because I have this legal document done. And, um, and it wasn't. And so then when you get to become a member of the, um, of the, the CFA, you get to go to the conference, the annual conference where, and the wonderful thing about Canadian franchising is it it's smaller. I'm part of the IFA as well. And that's like, that's big. Like it's just, it's overwhelming how many people are there. Whereas the Canadian franchise associate, when we're literally sitting with like the operations VP of Boston pizza and you're chit chat and you're like, Oh my God, this happened to me. Can you tell me? And he's like, dude, yeah, I'll send you my spreadsheet. I'll do this with you. Like it's the CFA is lovely. It's Canadian. It's like, we're lovely. And it's just generous and, and how to help you. And I have learned so much a through, through the CFA and the resourcing that the CFA has, but then also connecting with other franchisors and and finding out how they run their operations. How do they do the marketing programs? How do they do? It's just been oh, the greatest money I ever spent. Well, was, thanks for the plug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I'm not, I'm not even getting a kickback to say that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it is a very supportive community, I have to say. Um, it just is. the last yeah. question, I suppose, from somebody who is who is looking her, herself to to franchise. Um, Ashley has asked, how many locations do you suggest you have before you start to franchise? I imagine the answer is it depends because I feel like that's the most common answer. Any additional thoughts about that, Kristen? Yeah, it de it depends. What uh, what my journey was was I had the one location, then I opened up another because I was like, oh shit, this is going real well, and I'll you know I'll just do another one, um, and then then it was during that period where I was like, this is actually something, and I think like I I would like more. Initially, I wanted ten ten spots. Um, <laughs> We surprised that out, but uh, that was the initial goal, and so um, and so you know got got into got into franchising. And before we actually opened up, um, before I I started offering them, I actually built out a third location, and I built it um, in a smaller market, in a market that wasn't uh, like I was living in Toronto, and so that's where our first two locations were. And then I ended up moving to Hamilton, so I was like, I want to actually open up a here because I want to know a does this concept work. 
in a smaller market? Does it work in a market that's not as like she she as Toronto is? Um, and then also, um, can I can I kind of operate this more um, more virtually? Now, given everything's virtual, so everything's doable from a thing. But I did want to know how does this work when I've got a location that is not you know, easy for some, for somebody just to, you know, drive, drive down to it and see. So, um, I liked having tested that the market did work in a smaller, um, in, in a different market than I was used to just so that I had that confidence in being able to, uh, to sell, um, you know, to, to sell, uh, my units as, as a franchise concept for me. That's so yeah, great. it does depend. I would say that the main thing is though having having your op systems set. So don't even think about doing it if you don't have protocols for everything. If you don't have, you know, because you you want to replicate, you want a cookie cutter this because the guests are expecting, you know, a Big Mac to taste like a Big Mac and it's not going to taste like a Big Mac if you don't have exactly like it's this much ketchup, it's this much sauce. Big Mac's don't have ketchup. If it's this much Big Mac sauce, it's three pickles, it's these many onions. You need that so that your your customers um, can can trust the the uh, that they're going to get that consistency. And you can't deliver that consistency if you as the franchisor haven't really explicitly written that out. So it's not only the actual protocols and, and programs within the the operating business, but then like I said, making sure that you are equipped to be able to uh, to take a new franchise partner. Be like here's your email address. Like, hooray, you have a, you know, at the 10 spot email address now. And here's how you set up your email. Like it's, it's very nitty gritty, detailed um, information because those franchise partners are, are paying a lot of money to become part of, part of your brand. And you want to make sure that um, they're getting a great experience and that they're not scrambling and being like, I can't, you know, send out an offer of, you know, I want to start looking for my space. Like, what do I need to look for? And you don't have any of that criteria written up. Um, and so that's going to be, that's going to be key um, for you to develop and also to make sure that your franchisor that you're looking at getting into bed with has also developed. Well, thank you so, so much. It is now 202. You have been so tremendously informative. So I know that everybody appreciates it, Kristen. Um, thank this you. Officially concludes our learn and grow webinar for today i would like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank you christian for um, providing us I with mean, uh, perspective and knowledge yeah, today especially at the airport like, golly my pleasure <laughs> i know isn't it it's like nutty i'm so sorry for any of the um uh any of the uh noise interruptions yeah this is actually this is my <laughs> office for the day <laughs> not at all and for yeah. those who are asking, a copy of this recording will be available to you over the next few days. Uh, for information about uh, upcoming events, we encourage you to learn more at cfa.ca forward slash events. You'll find information about our upcoming Franchise Your Business uh, webinars there as well. On behalf of our guests, Kristen Gale, myself, and the CFA, thank you once again, and we hope you have an enjoyable rest of your day. So thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.